Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. Yes, and welcome uh, to another edition of Feminists Around the World. And we are still in Pride Month. Yay. Happy Pride to everyone. We hope you are still keeping safe and sane in the world of loopiness. I feel like there's so many ways to say that. Um, And today we are celebrating the amazing works of queer folk all over the world. And we are specifically celebrating trans model, activist, writer, and trailblazer Monroe Bergdorf. Woo. Woo. <laughs> I feel like there should be clapping. I know. I don't know. <laughs> like, <yay>. <laughs> <laughs> so Monroe Bergdorf grew up in Essex Village. Uh, she was born to a Jamaican father and an English mother who I believe were like middle, middle lower class. But had a pretty normal life. Uh, she attended school at the Bishop's Stortford High School and was an elite athletic swimmer, winning a lot of competitions. Um, And though she had a happy time in her primary school, she started feeling ostracized later when she fell out of place in high school. She told The Guardian, uh, quote, once gender roles were introduced and the girls and boys started dividing, I didn't really have a place because I was too girly for the boys and I wasn't a girl or seen as a girl. So I was ostracized, and the ostracism never stopped until I left high school. She went on to explain that her own family had difficulty accepting her gender dysmorphia, which did not help her own struggles. Uh, During her teen and young adult years, policies like Section 28 uh, in England were introduced, which bans schools from, quote, promoting queerness and homosexuality. That and a 1999 incident, which highlighted the institutional racism within law enforcement in London, only made her insecurities and struggles worse. And it wasn't until she was able to leave to study at the University of Brighton that she was able to be her true self. She told The Guardian, I felt I belonged at Brighton. I didn't go to university for reasons of academia. I went to start a different life. And though she started to transition um, and stepping and living into her new life, she still struggled as many trans women do. In her memoir, Transitional, she talks of her experiences in her life, all the good and bad, including being assaulted by men. Here's a quote from that Guardian article. In the book, she describes a terrifying sexual assault by a man she met on a night out. When you look at someone and you know they want to kill you and they don't see you as human enough to respect you when you say no, you don't want to have sex with them and rape you anyway. That just kills a part of you. She chokes up. I don't know how I can unsee that. I still struggle to think of that period because I lost all hope. After that, I started hating myself a lot and entered abusive relationships because I didn't think I deserved any more. You went looking for them? I wasn't looking for them, but what I was attracted to wasn't healthy. I'd see people who would display controlling behavior as somebody who cared. I just wasn't in a good place. And the quote continues. She says her story is the story of so many trans women— Dysfunctional relationships, abuse, seeking solace in drugs and alcohol, mental health collapsing. At one point, she was so worried that she called the police to protect her from herself. Since that time, she's become more active in the trans and queer community, so much so that she was referred to as a cornerstone of London's trans scene in 2014. Uh, Her impact in the queer community and the modeling community soon led her to be hired by L'Oreal as the first transgender model for the UK campaign in 2017, but was soon dropped when Bergdorf spoke out her frustrations after the Charlottesville Virginia Unite the Right rally, the white supremacist rally that uh, actually left people injured. Her words were to the point and unapologetic, filled with anger and despair, uh, as she told The Guardian, quote, Well, would you expect people who were heavily traumatized by racism to be balanced and calm? The idea that people should speak about the trauma and oppression they have experienced in a way that is digestible for people who don't experience it. I mean, I was angry. We were watching one of the most violent displays of racism in history. It was horrendous. Of course, I was angry. I think I had a right to be. And the reactions to it were not only damaging, but emotionally traumatizing. She keeps going on in the interview saying, when you see the level of hatred directed at you, it makes you fearful for your life. I was scared to go under the water when I was in the bath because I was convinced someone would hold me under. Things go through your head that you would never think of if you hadn't gone through that. People said they knew where I lived, that they were going to attack me with acid, that they would get me when I least expected it. It was endless. 
But she did get some vindication as L'Oreal not only rehired Bergdorf, but publicly apologized for their handling of the previous incident. The president of L'Oreal Paris released a statement saying, I had an honest, transparent, and vulnerable conversation with Monroe Bergdorf. We listened to each other and shared our feelings and perspectives on the situation with open hearts and minds. It was a powerful moment of human connection. Here is what I heard from her. Three years ago, Monroe felt silenced by a brand, Royal Paris, that had the power to amplify her voice. While we both agree today that negative labels should not be used to define all individuals in any group, I understand much better the pain and trauma that were behind Monroe's words back then and the urgency she felt to speak in defense of the Black community against systemic racism. I regret the lack of dialogue and support of the company showed Monroe around the time of termination. We should have also done more to create a conversation for change as we are now doing. We support Monroe's fight against systemic racism. And as a company, we are committed to work to dismantle such systems. And though she did struggle with the negativity and backlash at the time she was going through the controversy, she still continued to push in her fight for the rights for the trans community. At the time, as more attacks on trans women seem to be happening, Bergdorf has been right there to keep fighting. And she's not surprised by the continued pushback and weaponizing of the trans community. She told The Guardian this, Whenever there are gains made for marginalized communities, there is always a pushback. Just before Black people gained civil rights, there was a war. There's definitely a war on trans people. It's not a civil war, but it is a war within the media. It's a war on trans people, and we are fighting literally for our lives. And she goes on in another article written by GQ. When we see progress from a marginalized community at speed, there will be pushback. With hashtag MeToo and Time's Up, the ongoing conversations surrounding misogyny, there are people who felt disenfranchised by that because they don't know who they are without it. You give them a platform and they find other people who don't know who they are and you end up with Andrew Tate. It's exactly the same with a trans conversation. There's a lot of people who'd rather chastise other people without asking themselves who they are. A lot of it is projection. And she has used her memoir as a beacon of hope for those who may be having a hard time with all the negativity and hate that are aimed at the trans community. She says about her book she hopes that it will, quote, change the trajectory of young trans folk hating themselves and feeling alone. It feels good to have taken a fair amount of pain and confusion and sadness and turned it into something that I hope will empower them. It'll be here when I'm dead and gone. And Bergdorf's hard work has been recognized. She has been awarded the Gay Times Honor for British Community Trailblazer for the fifth annual Gay Times Honor Celebration in London in 2021. Featured as one of the cover stars for the Honors edition of Gay Times Magazine, named Changemaker of the Year in 2018 by Cosmopolitan UK, and was the first transgender person to be featured on the cover of the magazine, which was for the 50th anniversary issue. Right. And obviously, as we said, she has a uh, memoir that was released this year. I'm sure it's going to be amazing. We should probably put that on our list as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we just want to celebrate the amazing work she does and continues to do and congratulate her on her amazing accomplishments. And we're there with her in the fight. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be checking back in on this. I love how many, our book club list is so long and so varied. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But also, listeners, we love getting your suggestions for this segment or any other segments. You can email us at stephaniamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at momstuffpodcast or on Instagram and TikTok at Stuff I Never Told You. We're also on YouTube. We also have a tea public store. It has <gasps> new merch. What? <laughs> what? Uh, and we also have a book that what? you can pre-order at stuffyoushouldreadbooks.com. If we sound a little rusty, it's because we've been doing our audiobook. And it was a different experience. <laughs> so we're recovering from that. Um, and yes, uh, thanks as always to our super producer, Christina, our executive producer, Maya, and our contributor, Joey. Thank you all. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff on Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, you can check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.